Okay, so this is the second talk of part uh, part two today, uh, the first day of the workshop. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Enrique Torres Giese from Trinity Western University, and um, he's going to tell us about commutator equations in finite groups. So, yeah. Thank you, Shiha. Thank you for the invitation. Well, as you can see here, um, I will be talking about this type of equations in finite groups. So I know that a lot of the work that has been done about the spaces of homomorphisms from a free abelian group has been done a much on Lie groups. I will be uh, sharing some insight as to what's uh, been done and what can be said about the case of finite groups. So here in this talk, G will be always a finite group. Let me find a nice angle here to write, okay. And well, here, uh, what I want is to fix an element in the group, let's call it little g. And we want to consider the following uh, equation to start off. And it's this, so the commutator of two elements, let's say x and y equals g. So here, in this case, um, x uh, comma y with brackets is the usual commutator. So x inverse, y inverse, um, x, y. And well, this is a kind of equations that we will be considering and I will be uh, mentioning some applications and some motivation as well as to why we would like to study this kind of equations. So some basic comments here, of course, you can see that G uh, here in this case has to be in the derived group of the group G. And perhaps you know from basic algebra that not all the elements in the derived group have to be commutators like in this equation. So let me mention that here very quickly. Not every element of a G prime is a commutator. So one has to be careful with these uh, kind of equations. Now, if I ask you a counterexample, perhaps um, you can't think of one because uh, usually we are told, well, this is the case that not every element of the derived group is a commutator, but we are usually not given a, a counterexample. And it's because the smallest counterexample is a group of order 96. And in this case, the derived group has order 32, um, but it has only 29 commutators. Twenty-nine. So this is some basic algebra. And well, let me bring your attention now to something more interesting here related to this equation and is uh, a conjecture that was posed by Orr in 1951. So he was working with the alternating group at that time and he proposed the following. He said, well, it seems like if we consider finite non-abelian simple groups, Then the equation that I showed you, the commutator equation x, y equals g, this system, which is essentially made of only one equation, is consistent. And he proved it for the alternating group. Mm -hmm. 
So that was um, the conjecture that he proposed, and this conjecture has a long story in group theory. It was uh, recently, well, not very, very recent, but was recently proved in 2010. So it took about 60 years to be proved. So this conjecture was proved by loss. Sorry, what do you mean by consistent? Do you mean there are three elements which satisfy the equation? Or exactly, or that's it's always a solution that you can find elements x and y satisfying the, the for equation. G. For, for any yeah. fixed g, there's... Okay. That. So here I should perhaps mention here that if g is a finite non-abelian simple group, and again, uh, g is an element that you fix ahead of time, then this equation is consistent. That means you can always find the elements x and y satisfying this. So this conjecture was proved by uh, these people. It's known as the lost proof. It was proved by Liebeck, O'Brien, uh, Shalef, and Tip. And it was proved around 2010, if I recall correctly. And one of the key ingredients to prove this conjecture that has a long story and a lot of people were working on this over these 60 years is character theory. So this is one of the reasons why I want to bring your attention to this conjecture and to these equations. So one of the main ingredients is character theory. Does their proof depend on the classification of simple groups? Um, I think so, yes. So they went over different families and cases. And well, I'm going to be uh, providing some insight into the proof as to what is, let's say, the main tool for the um, final proof of this. But yes, it does depend on the classification. OK. So once we have this in place, we can propose the following uh, function. So I'm going to define a function here. I'm going to denote it by F2 of G. So little g is an element in a finite group. And well, you can consider the following. So we're going to be counting pairs of elements in the group, order pairs, whose commutator is equal to little g. OK. So in this context, um, Orr's conjecture is essentially saying that if you have a finite abelian, finite, non-abelian, simple group, then this function is always positive. OK? So what is nice about this um, function here is that this is a class function. So that means essentially that this is a function that is constant on uh, conjugacy classes of the group. Okay, so why are we interested here in this workshop on this function? Well, if you compute F2 of 1, of course, you get the cardinality of the space of homomorphisms, the number of commuting pairs in this case in uh, the group G. And well, of course, you would like to perhaps try to extend this to... Um, arbitrary tuples, so that would be, of course, interesting here. And well, we can define Fn of 1 to be the cardinality of the commuting n tuples in G. So that is then um, begging for the following question. What would be a nice definition for Fn of G? Well, it's not rocket science. I think it's very natural to try to define this. I'm going to get to that in a few more minutes. But before getting to that, let me mention some motivation, again, um, examples uh, as to why we would like to study these kind of functions, these kind of equations. So some motivation behind F2 of 1 or Fn of 1. So in physics, perhaps you know this definition from um, Orbifolds. Is the so-called Euler uh, or more precisely Orbifold 
Euler characteristic. So if you have a group, a finite group acting on a manifold, then you can define the following. So I'm going to use this notation, chi of m comma g is going to be one over the order of the group. And then we're going to be computing the summation over the commuting pairs. So I'm going to write it like this, g1, g2 equals g2, g1 of the Euler characteristics of the fixed point sets by these elements, g1, g2. So this Euler characteristic was defined mainly because of some questions in physics, uh, was proposed by Witten and people in topology like Hirzebrook. Atiya, I believe at some point, Seagal, we're also looking at this kind of definition of the orbifold Euler characteristic. So this is one nice example. If you uh, try to look for some examples, I believe there are few calculations of these kind of um, numbers. The reason is because the index set is, well, difficult to play with. I mean, if you have a large finite group and perhaps you have a specific example in mind, well, it might be um, difficult to try to compute this. And well, once you have this in place, you could try to extend this to other um, cases, other situations. So something that you could say is, well, how about if we decorate this and we call this X2 and replace this by just, well, what I just said, commuting pairs. So you can write it as G1, G2 in the space of homomorphisms. And well, if you do so, well, you can come back over here and then extend this definition. And we'll just say, well, we can define higher versions of this. That was done by a student of Jack Morava, um, Tamanoi. So here, well, we have these tuples here. And then we look at the corresponding fixed point sets. Okay, so that's the so-called higher orbifold Euler characteristic of this action. So there is some nice calculations related to these uh, finite sets. So notice, of course, this is a finite set. G is finite. And well, in group theory, this is in physics, topology, if you want. In group theory, we have uh, some also nice applications of this uh, systems of equations. Um, so let me mention one here. So people have been interested in associating graphs to finite groups, and there's many ways you can do that. One of them is by means of the so-called commuting graph. Commuting graph of a finite group G, and essentially here you take the vertices to be um, the group elements, and then here uh, the edges are essentially determined by the following. X is adjacent to Y if they commute. OK, so this one is simple. And there is another one that is also nice, and is the non-commuting graph. I'm going to write it like this, the non-commuting graph of G. In this case, the vertices is essentially the group elements taking off the elements in the center of the group. And well, the edges will be determined by the condition that X and Y are adjacent. if they do not commute. Okay, 
So an application of this, which I find interesting, is the following. If you consider, again, uh, finite non-abelian non simple groups, we have the following theorem. So suppose that S1 and S2 are a finite non-abelian Uh, simple groups then these graphs are essentially able to characterize these type of groups in the following way if you have an isomorphism between the non-commuting graphs this is fancy C and then fancy G here of these groups then it's because you actually have to have an isomorphism between these finite non-abelian simple groups. So this result was recently proved about eight years ago. It took um, also several years to be completed throughout some cases. And this is an, another nice application, motivation behind the study of the space of commuting pairs or commuting tuples in a finite group. Now, going back to topology, you know, this has been mentioned already in the previous talk, you can consider the set of commuting tuples. This is a simplicial space, so you can afford using this a topological space. Uh, the notation, well, you can use this one, B2G, or if you want, you can use Bcom of G. And well, this gives rise to another simplicial space whose realization is E to G, and you have essentially this um, bundle here discovering in this situation. And what is nice is that you can describe in a combinatorial way this space E to G. So E to G can be written as a homotopy limit. Um, in this case, using these quotients. And well, we are using um, subgroups A in this posit here, and to G, the notation here for this is precisely um, the posit of all abelian subgroups of G. So this is the posit. Of all abelian uh, subgroups. Okay, so now we have these two nice spaces, become and E2G. Um, I believe Omar is going to be talking about these constructions when G is a finite group. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, not much has been said about these constructions when G is a finite group. A lot has been said when G is a Lie group, like for instance in the work of Alejandro, Fred, uh, Jose Manuel. They have done a lot of work, and other people, again, like mentor mentioned, don't feel bad if I don't mention to name out loud. Um, there's a lot of people already working on this, which is great. But again, not much has been said about these kind of constructions when G is a finite group. So there's some things that you can say, uh, that you can say about this uh, space E to G. If you, for instance, consider the coset poset of all proper subgroups. So let me write down here um, the definition. So we're going to consider the following collection. So I'm going to use this notation C2 of G. Is a set of all cosets. Okay, x here is an element in the finite group G, and a is 
a proper subgroup. Abelian subgroup. Okay. Well, you can consider this collection of uh, cosets, and well, um, there is an order on this set, and it's essentially just that of inclusion. Um, so we can simply notice that, that this is a poset. So here's a theorem. Um, this is essentially inspired by some work by uh, Ken Brown. I think Dan Ramras also worked on these kind of ideas at some point. So once again, suppose the G is finite. Uh, then we have the following. The space E to G is essentially equivalent to the geometric realization of the coset poset. Um, number two, if you consider the following function, I'm going to write it as capital P sub S of one, so one here stands for the identity of the group. And this is going to be some sort of probability function. It's essentially f as one, so remember the function f sub n is counting, commuting n tuples, so here I'm using this notation s, you will see why in a moment, uh, over the order of the group raised to the power of s. Okay, so this makes sense. Um, here, if s is a non-negative integer, you can say the following. So this function can also be written as a Dirichlet series. And what that means essentially is in this case, in this particular situation, is that you can extend it to the complex numbers. And well, once you do that, you can evaluate this function. I'm going to look at the case of uh, when s is equal to 2. And what you recover here, this. Oh, Okay, I need to make a correction. In this case, when s is equal to negative 1, there you are. So evaluate this at negative 1. So s is essentially uh, here to start off some integer. But because of this statement that this is a Dirichlet series, you can evaluate it at negative 1. Well, what you recover is the Euler characteristic of e to g. Okay, so that's that's nice. So this is some sort of bridge between um, basic algebra, finite groups, and in this case, these sort of probabilistic function and Euler characteristics. So let me give you a quick example. So for instance, if you consider the alternating, alternating group on five uh, symbols, um, the corresponding function p2 p sub s. Uh, here I should just call it p sub s perhaps. Okay, so I'm going to drop that one. So this one, 
when g is a5. You can compute this using the Mobius function associated to the coset poset and check that this can be written as the following. So again, it's a Dirichlet series. This is a 15 and then a 10 here over 20. And then the last one is a 20 over 60. So this is just a quick calculation example of the kind of things that you obtain when you uh, look at the specific examples. Okay. So going back to uh, the function I want to consider, which is fn of g, here is the definition that we're going to use. So remember, fn of 1 is essentially counting commuting n tuples. So now I'm going to define fn of little g. So this is going to be the set of all tuples of size n in the finite group, satisfying the following conditions. So we want these commutators, x sub i, comma x of j to be equal to little g. Okay. So that's the definition, and this is of course compatible with what I was saying about f fn of one being the commuting n tuples in the group G. So we have this definition, and well, this is also a class function. Can I just ask, you're, you're asking for every distinct pair, the commutator equal G, or what's happening? Can you repeat your question, please? So, so if I equals J, you get, you just get uh, the commutator is one, right? Right, so let me uh, include an extra condition here. Yes, so thank you for that. So here, I is strictly less than J in this definition, thank you. So this is a class function. And well, with this class function, we can define um, the following function, P, capital P of N of G. This is going to be, um, give me a second. Okay, sorry for the interruption here. So P sub n of G. Okay, back over here. I'm gonna define it to be F sub n of G over the order of G to the power of n. So this is some kind of uh, probability distribution. And well, we are going to discuss some basic properties very quickly here about this function. So this function has been around for a while um, in the case when n is equal to two and people have said a lot of things about this specific distribution. So for instance, let me mention here some basic properties perhaps you have seen before. If you look at P2 of one, well, of course, because this is a probability is no negative and well, it can be uh, checked that this is at most five eighths and this a bound here is sharp. Um, so here, of course, G is non-abelian. And we have this, this bound, 5 eighths. Uh, this one is, again, is sharp and can be realized by groups like, for instance, the dihedral group on 8. Uh, of, of order eight and the quaternions of order eight. So people in group theory have been studying this function and the distribution of the values of this function P2 of 
of one for different groups. And I've tried to classify the kind of groups that can take on specific values in the unit interval. Okay, so that's a basic property. Um, if you look at these um, other values, so P sub N, well, you can check again that you have a sequence like this. Now for triples, and well, this is telling you have this sequence. People have tried to consider when this sequence stabilizes and other uh, properties as well. Uh, number three, if you define k sub n of g to be um, the number of conjugacy classes of commuting n tuples, then it's not hard to check that pn plus 1 of 1, the identity here, is kn of g over the order of g to the power of n. And well, I mentioned this one, this third property here, because perhaps some of you know that if you take n equals 1, uh, the number of commuting pairs has to do with the number of conjugacy classes of the group. So when n is equal to 1, essentially what you recover is the classical uh, set of conjugacy classes. So this is also well known. Um, another thing that I think would like to mention here about this function um, fn and p sub n is this. It has to do with the geometry behind this uh, function. So for instance, what happens if you try to consider f3 of g? Well, something I think is, is useful here is to say, well, essentially we have triples. And we want them to have commutator equal to g in a specific order. The first one with the second. Okay, so the commutator is, is g. And then uh, the first one with the third. And then the second with the third. Okay, so I mentioned this because you could try to rearrange the conditions in the definition of f sub n. And well, it's not hard to see that you're going to get essentially the same number, the same values. So this is something that is, is useful in some calculations, in some proofs. And now comes Frobenius. So Frobenius, back to the 1800s, late 1800s, in 1896, he proved the following. Of course, the proof that he provided was perhaps not with the same notation that we're using here, but he essentially proved the following. If you take the summation, summation over all the reducible characters, then essentially what you have to consider is the order of the group divided by um, chi of 1. And well, you just have to go this number, which by the way is an integer because the degree of chi is always a divisor of the order of the group. So you multiply that integer by um, chi of g, and this is Frobenius' formula. Well, of course, you can rewrite it in many ways. One of them is when you take the order of the group out. And the reason why I did this is because this is important in the proof of Orr's conjecture. So here we have the summation over all the irreducible characters. So in the proof of the Orr's conjecture, of course, I'm not going to attempt to give you um, the proof here. A key, a key ingredient of the proof is to say, OK, if you want to show um, the following, the g is in the derived group, that is, f2 of g is positive, let me write it like this, if we want to 
to show that this is positive? Well, it suffices. to show that this quantity that I have over here is positive, this one. Okay, so the summation again is over all the irreducible characters. So we want to show that this is greater than zero. And well, you can rewrite this condition um, as follows. So this condition is essentially equivalent to saying that we want the absolute value of the summation here of this quotient to be in magnitude less than 1 when you take non-trivial representations, that is, characters of degree greater than 1. Okay. And well, this is essentially all I'm going to say about the proof of um, the Ors conjecture. So there is a whole industry about finding bounds for these values or characters. So people have been working on this for a while, and well, these were essentially the main ingredients. This identity, this formula by Frobenius, and um, finding bounds for the values of the characters of finite uh, simple groups. Okay, now before I move on to higher cases, let me mention very quickly here that in 2009, just the, the year before um, they proved the conjecture, Shalev proved using similar ideas the following. It's very, very nice. Um, this is a paper, I think it's, it's a collection of papers in the Annals of Mathematics. So here, he proved the following. Shalev, he said, if you have a finite non-abelian simple group, I'm just going to write like this, simple group, then the probability uh, here, P2 of G, goes to 1 as the order goes to infinity. So this was a very let's say, a strong indication that Orr's conjecture was, was correct. So he gave this probabilistic result. And then the year after, they were able to come up with the proof, the full proof of the conjecture. OK, so now, how about, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the work I have done in this regard, how about f3 of g. What can we say about this function? So we have Frobenius formula. What can we say about this one? Well, let me tell you. It turns out that it's possible to provide a formula in terms of the irreducible characters of the finite group, but the formula is pretty, pretty complicated. So here is the result I um, prove with Canto Irimoto. And well, I, I need to give you some notation, and it's the following. So suppose that we have the same notation as before, chi, an irreducible character of the finite group, and we define the following function. I'm going to call it theta um, of chi of a. Little a here is an element in the group. Um, this is going to be a crazy summation. So you're going to take the summation over all the elements of the group of the following quantities. So we need to consider the centralizer in G of A, B, and then you take the coset of B with respect to the centralizer, and you in uh, take the intersection of that centralizer with the centralizer of A, take the cardinality, okay? And then you multiply this by the irreducible character of the commutator. Okay, so this is this is the key. It took us quite a bit of work to come up with the, the formula, the calculations. Um, once you have this in place, you can define the following um, number. So m of chi is the summation now over all the elements in the group. Do, do you mean the coset in the formula is centralizer of a, b? 
times b or yes this is a is concept. concept okay yeah this is a concept it's a set and then you take the intersection with the centralizer so that's correct okay so now we're going to uh, take the summation of all these values okay so once we have this now um, the result that we have is this that this function m well hold on the function theta is a class function number one and well this is essentially what you need to compute f3 f3 of g like in Frobenius formula you can write like this in terms of the reducible characters so essentially we are computing the coefficients of this class function when you write it in terms of the reducible characters using all of this machinery um, I know the formula doesn't look very friendly there are some cases when you can work all the calculations and get as explicit examples completed but it takes takes work to work with these kind of calculations okay now in the paper that we wrote with this result we were able to compute this formula specifically for some some uh, families of groups like for instance the dihedral groups so I'm, I'm not going to show you the formulas because, again, they are not very, let's say, friendly. But what I can tell you is that we use these formulas, these ideas, to prove the following theorem. So remember I mentioned to you at the beginning that we have this uh, simple-looking commutator equation. Well, you can extend this, right, to other cases. This is essentially in terms of F2. Well, um, the result is this. If you take n greater than or equal to 3 and you take an element in the alternating group then the following system which is essentially the one induced by f3 is consistent in the symmetric group so let me write it here x1 with x2 x1 with x3 and then the last one is x2 with x3 okay so here g is fixed so the claim, as I said, is that this is consistent. That is, we can find a solution always. But be careful, this is consistent in the symmetric group. Okay. Now we have some computational evidence using GAP indicating that this is perhaps also true uh, here if we replace this with the altern alternating group. And this is essentially an extension of Orr's conjecture now in the case when we have triples, not just pairs, but triples. Okay. So, um, some things I think I'm going to mention, and then I will be closing in just a couple of minutes, will be some um, questions and perhaps some homework for you. Uh, so again, so some conjectures that we have. Remember that I mentioned that in, I'm going to scroll up, my apologies here. In the formula of Frobenius, this one, this is a character because these numbers here are integers. Well, we have evidence, computational evidence, indicating that that's the case also for F3 of G, the function F3. So number one, and actually this is a set of conjectures and questions, and this is what I'm going to be using to close the, the talk. So number one, it looks like the function f3 of g is also a character. Okay, another one I think is also interesting is this. What happens if you go higher, let's say to F4 of G? Well, we have a conjecture, we have some computational evidence and you can actually work out some calculations explicitly for some specific families of groups. It looks like this is always zero 
when G is not the identity. At least, well, as I said, we have some, some cases that we have already checked, but at least we could say that this is or should be the case when G is a non-abelian finite simple group. So this is again a conjecture homework for you if you are interested in this kind of calculations. I think these are nice questions that can be um, considered. And here is two more questions I would like to propose here, perhaps for the discussion that is right after. Um, and is this, can we find a topological proof of Orr's conjecture? And perhaps a proof more specifically using maybe E to G or other versions of this space, perhaps with other values. Of Orr's conjecture. Now, you may be thinking, well, he's perhaps just speculating. Um, not so much, because if you remember, I mentioned that the commuting graph, the commuting graph can be used, sorry, the non-commuting graph, uh, that's the one, uh, can be used to characterize a non-abelian finite simple group. So this, this might be something reasonable, as I said at the beginning, and I'm going to stress it again. Um, we don't know much about these spaces when G is finite, but this would be perhaps a nice project to take on. And number four, last question I think I would like to propose here. Um, can we characterize finite simple groups? By means of this space, E to G. Again, this is in light of this result I mentioned to you about the non-commuting graph being enough to characterize finite simple groups. So I'm going to stop here, and if you have questions, well, just let me know. Okay, thank you, Enrique. I think you have more questions than we have, so <laughs> so uh, thank you for the uh, interesting talk. Uh, any any questions for uh, Enrique? Uh, can I quickly ask, is there any work on um, when G is essential, uh, little g is essential element, like on the on the bounds, or for example, for P two? There, there, there are some um, results on bounds, like the one I mentioned over here for specific cases. The one people have been paying more attention to is this one, but I'm not so sure if anything has been said or could be said about this, for instance, kind of result if you replace this by a central element. Um, I don't know. I think it could be an interesting question to perhaps work on for a while. Yeah, but I, I don't have any specific uh, information in mind. Okay. Thanks. So um, now that you're here, you mentioned that uh, something has been said about when that sequence PN of one stabilizes. Could, what kinds of results are there? Okay. Um, what I know is that these, these values, this one, the first one over here, um, it's not so small, but these values are very, very small. So that's what I can tell you. There are some specific uh, upper bounds that go very, very quickly to zero. That's something I can, I can tell you right on the spot. Another thing I can tell you is that if one of them is equal to one, then all of them have to be equal to one. Um, the other thing I can tell you, and I think I mentioned is at some point in the talk, is that people have used this one, the first one more, to characterize specific groups that can take on specific values in the in the unit interval here. Mm -hmm. Wait, uh, so below fifth, uh, five eighths, is there like a 
gap or can any or can you get arbitrarily close to to five eighths? Sorry, can you repeat your yeah. question? So, what what is known about the possible values? Like specifically, I was wondering, you can the highest value for P two is five eighths. Mm -hmm. Can you take on values arbitrarily close to that from below? Uh, no, I think there are gaps. Oh, that, that's very interesting. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, good question. So you have the the interval, and then you have the five eighths. Uh, there are some results. I can't remember them from the top of my head, but you mm -hmm. can say things, for instance, uh, what happens if you take uh, groups whose P2 is less than a half? And there are results that have been already uh, done and classified the groups with this kind of property. And I believe there are some gaps here where I can recall uh -huh. what is the next possible uh, value that you could have here, but yes, there are results here on this. Mm -hmm. mm, I'm trying to, oh yes, if you want to know a little bit about this, um, there is some work of Les Scott, I believe that's the mm -hmm. person, Paul Scott. Okay. He's in France, I believe, and he has some results. There is also some results by Robinson more recent, and uh, perhaps I'm gonna get right the spelling, Gurlanic. They also have some results on, on this kind of uh, values here. Okay. Can I, ask, can, I, can I ask one reference? Uh, the, the, what is the reference for the non-committing uh, graph there? that you mentioned? I can uh, tell you there are three papers. One that you can check, and I know right, I can give you right here for these kind of things, is a paper by Peter Cameron. Peter Cameron has a paper, um, I think was in the archive, I put in the archive, I think at some point this year, I think is something like graphs on groups. I think that's the title. And well, he goes over these and there are some references. Well, it's, it's a survey paper. And well, he goes over these kind of constructions and other, other graphs. Okay, thank you. I had a question. Um, you have this Conjecture, I guess. Uh, so we know F two is a is a character. You think F three is a character? Um, do you have you have a, a lot of evidence to support that conjecture? Or? Yes, we have evidence. For instance, with let's say uh, dihedral groups, some specific extra special groups, and also with some uh, finite non-abelian uh, groups, we have some some computational evidence using GAP. The problem, well. I mean, it's, it's just some calculations that we have already uh, completed, but it's it's not clear from there uh, how we can, for instance, use this formula that is right here to prove that indeed these these right. guys here are integers. We we don't know how to use this at this moment. Mm -hmm. Do you do you suspect that F n is a character for higher n, or is that yeah, that should be the case. I spoke to a long time ago with Professor Martin Isaacs. He's perhaps you have read his book on, on character theory, and he also completed some calculations. And he was like, "This is a character," but he he couldn't um, think of a way of proving uh, how this could be indeed a character. Oh, very nice. I have one silly question. Did you do this talk with a mouse? Were you writing with a mouse? Um, it's a stylus. And a stylus, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I, mean, sorry. I was, I was, I was going to praise you for writing, writing with a mouse. <laughs> my writing was pretty bad. My apologies. No, no, I, I, I thought it was a mouse and I was going to praise you for writing so legendary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, no. <laughs> well, anyway, very nice talk. It, look, it looks pretty good, actually. Even uh, in Japan, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think I was improving over 
over the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I'm gonna okay. stop my screen. Okay, so thank you uh, so much, Enrique. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank Enrique. you.